Today we're in Acts chapter 4. We're going to actually be bridging Acts chapter 4 and to Acts chapter 5. Uh, these sections go together uh, somewhat. Remember, the chapter breaks are not inspired. Those numbers are uh, put there over time. But that's where we'll be. We'll be starting in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Why don't you stand with me, and we'll read the Bible together, and then we'll pray, and we'll look at what God has to say to us. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32, says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph who is also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having sold it and brought them at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church, and upon all who heard these things. And let's pray. Father, I am so grateful for every part of your word, those that inspire us to, to lift our hands in praise and worship, and those parts which may cause us to tremble a bit, be sober-minded, and perhaps fear. It is all your word, and it all points to Jesus Help us see him in this and every text we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Why do we give? When it comes to Christianity and giving, there's no lack of examples, both positive and negative. On the one hand, there's a widow in the temple who was commended by the Lord Jesus when she gave all she had, even though it added up to mere pennies. On the other hand, there were the Pharisees who gave loudly and proudly for everyone to see. Of course, if you turn on what I will say so-called Christian television, there is abundance of the latter sort of example. And to name names, you've got men and women like Benny Hinn, Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen, Paula White, Joyce Myers, and many, many others who have manipulated multitudes of people to giving them millions of dollars, all in the name of, quote, receiving a blessing. And in their false theology, the preacher is the blessed anointed one. And so if you give to the blessed, you share in his or her blessing. If you plant financial seeds in faith to them, it grows into a harvest of wealth and prosperity. In other circles, this would be known as a Ponzi scheme. It's false theology. This is why these preachers don't blink an eye when they're asking donations for their latest private jet or think twice about wearing the most expensive clothes and all the rest. Why? Because to them, signs of wealth are signs of God's favor. So from their point of view, might as well try to live as opulent a life as possible. Now, it's all Mm -hmm. anti-biblical. Of course, you know, when they're they're shouting out and they're preaching and all the rest, occasionally they're going to quote a Bible verse correctly, but their foundation is irreparably faulty. That, though, brings us back to that original question. Why do we give? For them, they give in order to get. 
if they can't get anything out of it, there's no reason to give it. You might call it the, the Jerry Maguire school of giving. Show me the money, right? It's based in pride and selfishness, anti-biblical. Real Christian giving is different. Authentic Christian giving is not done from selfishness, but from selflessness. Biblical Christian giving, giving isn't done to receive a blessing, but to be a blessing. We give because of Jesus, out of thanks to Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, leaving the results to Jesus. Now, will we receive a benefit in some way? Perhaps, maybe in this life, maybe in the life to come. Maybe the blessing is just the joy of knowing we please our Heavenly Father. He is the reason we give, not me. You place yourself there. He, not me. Now, all that brings us to a contrast between the two forms of giving. We see it in chapters 4 and 5 of Acts, the book of Acts. On one hand, we see giving done right, and on the other hand, we see it done wrong. One is done from a pure heart to the glory of God. The other is done from sin and receives the judgment of God. Now, back up a bit for context. At this point, the church, remember, is fairly new still. Time is passing, of course, but it was still just a few weeks, maybe a few months after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And we've nailed that the last several times and really driven it home. And there's a reason why we've got to keep that fact in mind that in these early chapters, it, it was so close to the resurrection because that concept is so foreign to us. We've always lived, you and I, with the mindset that the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ is ancient history. It's nearly 2,000 years ago to us. And even when we read the letters of Paul, we're reading them from the perspective that we're reading a history of Paul's telling what happened in the past, even though it wasn't that far in the past for him. But in these early chapters, they were living it at the time. Jesus wasn't some older figure from years back. He was still headline news. The crucifixion, the resurrection were still very much current events from their perspective. So think of it this way. If there was ever a moment in time in the church where people expected to see miraculous things coming from God, supernatural things, this was the time because Jesus had just risen from the dead, right? We follow? We've got to keep that in mind, which sets the context really for chapter 5, doesn't it? The things we read there. God works in supernatural ways. Because it was new, the church is still experiencing all kinds of new things. They're taking their baby steps, so to speak. They're empowered by God the Holy Spirit. They're directed by God the Holy Spirit to devote themselves to doctrine, fellowship, worship, breaking of bread and in prayers. Some, of course, among them, like Peter and John, were even led by the Holy Spirit to pronounce Jesus' healing to a, a lame man in the temple that led to the first uh, case of official persecution against the church. In response, you know, the Peter and John were filled anew with the Holy Spirit. They're able to respond in boldness to this tribunal against them. They're commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus. They boldly refuse. They take their vow to the Lord in prayer. They ask for his help, and immediately God answers. Fills all the church again with the Holy Spirit, empowers them to preach the gospel as boldly as they have ever had. <laughs> Baby steps, but big steps. And things don't stop at this point. Overall, the church continues to live as a church, trying to find the best way to live out their love of Jesus, the unity brought to them by God the Holy Spirit. But not everyone was unified. There are always, of course, exceptions to the rule, and it's shown in another church first, and that's the first instance of judgment. As with too many other sins, it takes place over the issue of money, which means it really takes place over issues of the heart, pride and selfishness. What the church needed was purity and humility, which of course is the same thing we need today. We give God our humble, our pure worship. So let's see them do it right first. They're giving rightly, the speaking of the unity of the church at the end of chapter 4, starting verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, of one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So after providing the narrative of the first instance of persecution against the apostles, Luke takes a break in his writing to give another kind of midpoint summary, just like he did at the end of chapter 2. Uh, just here's how it, the church is doing overall, right? Here, how did they respond to those threats from the Jewish Sanhedrin? And apparently the church didn't miss a beat in it. 
The threats of the council, though surely they were frightening, it did not divide the church. It did not cause them to scatter. No, it strengthened their resolve, and their unity in the Spirit was only stronger than it had ever been before. And although Luke does not use the term one accord here, he certainly gives a good description of what the word means. He said the church was of one heart and one soul. In other words, they were of one singular purpose. They wanted the same. They desired the same. They, they had prayed, remember, to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit with boldness, and that gave them common cause, not only in their proclamation of the gospel, but in everything else they did as a church body. You know, it's no wonder that Jesus prayed that his church would be unified, as he did in John chapter 17. Let them be one as I am in you, you and me. John 17, 21. That's an immense kind of a unifying factor that we have with one another, that we be as unified together as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are within the Trinity. A church with a common purpose can accomplish much. A church that is truly united around the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to put everything else into perspective. Think about all the various things over which we've seen churches divide. Gossip, finances, music style, personal preferences, program preferences, personal offenses, refusal to reconcile with one another. How many of those things fall by the wayside or just really just get resolved when God's people get refocused on the gospel and the Great Commission, when they unify over the things that are truly important. You know, when that happens, debates that are centered on church finances really become centered on, well, how best does this expense help the gospel? Sure helps cut through the mess. Disagreements between people find reconciliation because we start thinking about, the gospel, well, Jesus died for me and my sins and forgave me, so surely I can forgive somebody else. And if we forgive one another, then we can go out and extend God's message of forgiveness to the rest of the world. Things like gossip and personal preferences get exposed as just truly petty once we start remembering the importance of the gospel, the importance of our mission. People need a purpose around which to unite. Guess what? Jesus has given us one. It's got a title. It's called the Great Commission. And that's what happened here. They had a common purpose, common heart, common soul. Also had common possessions. The people were one, so it followed that their stuff was one. They shared everything as there was need. This was a practical demonstration of their love for Christ. It was an outworking of the faith that God had provided for them already, and they knew that God would continue to provide in normal, everyday means. Of course, sometimes God's provision is miraculous. Other times it's through the hands and feet of his people. And so when the early church saw a need, they just filled it. They didn't ask questions about it. They just did what needed to be done. They had the perspective that everything that they owned ultimately was owned by the Lord Jesus. So why not give it to a, another brother or sister if there might be a need for that? As to the extent of their common ownership of all things, keep in mind this was a specific church congregation at a specific point in time. There's no indication around the rest of the New Testament that this was the norm across the rest of Christianity throughout the first century. What Luke describes here at this point with this common ownership is commended, but not commanded. Understand the difference? What's shown here is the heart behind their commonality is the thing to be repeated. Everything we have does belong to the Lord Jesus. And what he says to give, we give, right? Stuff is stuff. So you can hold on to it lightly and let it go because it's low priority in our life. Souls are more important than stuff. But considering that this practice of commonality is nowhere else found in the other churches, instructions to the other churches when Paul is setting things up with other churches all the rest, and wasn't even continued by the Jerusalem church, it's not a practice to be forced on modern churches today. And besides, if it's ever forced, it's not of God. This is obviously here of God. Verse 33, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So in addition to having a common purpose and common possessions, they had a common witness or to keep with the peace, a common proclamation. 
right? The apostles had a singular confession of Jesus' resurrection. They would not, and couldn't if they tried, cease preaching the name of Jesus. Remember, this was the very thing that they were commanded not to speak, yet they continued, just as they said they would, and prayed that God would help them that they would. And as they continued preaching Jesus, they concentrated specifically on Jesus' resurrection. Why is that? Because that was the ultimate proof of everything else that followed. Everything that the church was empowered to do was because there was a living Jesus who empowered them to do it through God the Holy Spirit. Every time the apostles or any Christian spoke of the forgiveness available through Jesus Christ, they could do so saying, you know, remember just a few weeks ago when you crucified Jesus of Nazareth? Well, he's risen from the dead, and I personally am a witness of his resurrection. You know, they were preaching it all the time. The resurrection was not optional to the gospel of Jesus Christ at the early church. It was part and parcel with it, and it should still be that way for us today. Amen. We remember, of course, that the good news, gospel, is Jesus. Not just about Jesus, it is Jesus. The gospel is not a presentation method, uh, be it the Romans Road, the Four Spiritual Laws, Way of Master, Evangelism Explosion, or whatever. Those are presentation methods, and they can be very effective presentation methods to get to the gospel, but the gospel itself is Jesus. But we cannot proclaim Jesus without proclaiming his death and resurrection. Because to proclaim Jesus, we've got to proclaim him as he is. And he's none other than God the Son, who came for us, died for us at the cross for our sins, rose from the dead. You can't slice that in pieces and parcels and claim it to be the full gospel. You've got to preach it all. So they preach Jesus in his resurrection. How they give their witness of the gospel, it says here, with great power. This is more of the answer of the prayer that they had prayed earlier in chapter 4. They prayed, remember, for boldness, but they also prayed for what? Signs and wonders. Now, some specific examples of those signs and wonders will be given later in chapter 5. In fact, it's probably going to be seen very soon in chapter 5, too, if we think of it that way. But Luke summarizes it here, showing that God backed up this gospel proclamation with God-given power. So the Holy Spirit is giving authentication to the message that was being preached. And they experienced what in these things as they preached these things? Great grace. Luke doesn't say they have it easy. They had great grace. Doesn't say they had wealthy prosperity. Doesn't say that everything was days in, days out, sun and roses. In fact, he doesn't describe it at all. He says it was great grace. Literally, it's mega, mega grace in the Greek. Doesn't say what that looked like, but there wasn't any doubt that God gave it. The church was faithful to God's call faithful to God's message, and they experienced God's great grace. They were blessed beyond measure. And it wasn't just for the 12 apostles, it was upon them all. You might think that God's grace and his favor was limited to the, the, the 12, or limited to, to those who performed miracles, limited to those who had some sort of public ministry. By now, of course, the believers numbered in the thousands, and not everybody had a public platform for ministry, but they were still all blessed with God's great grace. Why is that? Because every ministry is important, big, small, public, private. If you're doing it for the Lord, you're doing it for His glory, and God gives great grace. And by the way, before we leave this, you might note the terminology here in verse 33 about the Lord Jesus. More and more throughout the book of Acts, the title Lord is going to be associated with, with Jesus. The apostles had referred to him as the Lord Jesus in chapter 1, verse 21, when they're getting ready to replace Judas's position among the apostles. And specifically on the day of Pentecost, he said that, you know, God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. But most of the other usage we've seen so far for Lord has been to God the Father. It's been ambiguous. But here, specifically, the Lord Jesus. Usually the word Lord meaning a reference to God. The reason this matters is that it emphasizes the early church believed the deity of Jesus. And that's a big deal, right? The, the Jews would readily affirm that the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, was the descendant of David who would reign on the throne of Jerusalem. It's another thing to affirm that the Son of David is truly God himself. But that was always the teaching of Scripture. It was just tough for some people to reconcile it together up until Jesus personally demonstrated how it could be done. 
But the deity of Jesus was not something that developed over time that the church gradually grew into. They believed it from the very, very beginning. We see it here, the Lord Jesus. Anyway, verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. Now, Luke already wrote of the common purpose of the church leading to the sharing of common possessions. This is one of the ways that it worked out, right? The possessions that were shared by Christians were just smaller things like coats and food, though surely it was, but it even stretched to real estate. People were willing to, to sell out the larger items they own, freely donate the proceeds to the church if that meant that the poor among them might survive, and when it said those who lack, that's literally a reference to the poor. Again, remember this is a specific time and place. This is done from a pure heart, pure motive. Ultimately, for the long term, it didn't work. The book of Acts doesn't close before it shows Paul receiving financial offerings from other churches to send back to Jerusalem and Judea overall. See it already in Acts chapter 11, verse 29. The book of Romans ends, Acts, Roman, excuse me, Romans chapter 15, verse 25, 26, talks specifically about getting an offering for those in Jerusalem. Problem was, is that eventually the possessions of the people in Jerusalem ran out. No more to sell off and distribute. So again, the heart of the people, that's what we emulate, not necessarily the exact meth method. Please note, by the way, what this does not teach, what some people try to force upon the scriptures. It doesn't teach communism. Okay, this is free will giving, not mandated forfeiture. Nobody, including Ananias, as we'll soon see, nobody was forced to sell off anything, forced to give anything. They did this as a free will offering unto God, gladly giving these things as an outward expression of their worship. Giving that's forced isn't giving, it's theft. Okay, so that's not what happened here. Verse 36, And Joseph, or Joseph, was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. A Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, talked about what happened. Here's a prime example of that good kind, that right kind of giving. It's found in Barnabas. Luke's giving the reader a brief introduction of Barnabas. It becomes a very important figure later on in the book of Acts. His given name is Joseph. He acquires a nickname that stuck. The apostles called him the son of encouragement. He was the kind of guy you wanted to be around. You, wanted, you needed a friend. You wanted to be around Barnabas. He was one of the first to believe uh, that Saul, Paul's conversion to Christianity was sincere um, took the time to build into his life, bring him to the apostles. Barnabas was related to John Mark. He believed the best of John Mark, even when John Mark failed Barnabas and Paul out on the road. Uh, eventually built so much into John Mark's life that even Paul said, this guy's valuable, let him come minister to me here. Uh, Barnabas is even one of the few men outside of the 12 that's specifically listed as an apostle, according to Acts 14.14. 14. So a very important, though often unsung, hero of our biblical history. Barnabas' gift, though, that he gave, it was pure. It was done in humility of heart. Like others in the church who had done so, he had sold his land, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Scholars debate on whether or not the expression is literal. Um, obviously, you know, Barnabas wasn't bowing in worship before Peter, John, Andrew, and the others setting a bag of gold or silver at their toes. But there was a, a practice of teachers having an elevated seat to, to teach from and perhaps laying uh, the, on the, the bag of money on the steps leading up to those chairs was the, the practice. Again, commentaries disagree, but the main idea is one of humility. He just gives the gift. No strings attached. Barnabas didn't ask for special favors. He just wanted to be generous unto God. Now this is always God's intent for us in our giving. Humble, sincere, no strings attached, cheerful giving. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. By the way, this is in a section where he's telling the Corinthian church to prepare themselves to receive an offering for the church that's in Jerusalem. But he writes this, 
But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. See, that's simple giving. That's pure-hearted giving. Whatever it is you purpose to give, just give that and give it cheerfully. There's no manipulation here from the outside. There's no further planning as to what I'm going to get out of the deal. It's just generous giving unto the Lord. It's giving unto the Lord just the same way He gave unto you. No strings attached. Here it is. It's a pure gift. Now, with that in mind, some of us might think of the question, considering, because we're reading about it, Barnabas' gift was widely known. You say, well, what if it wasn't at the time? Well, it's written down in the book of Acts. It's widely known now. Did he violate this sort of instruction just to give it unto the Lord, give cheerfully? In fact, Jesus even said, don't give in such a way where it's trumpeted, right? We, we referenced it earlier, but from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, Jesus speaking, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret himself will reward you openly. Did he violate this command? Do it secretly. Don't let one know the other's doing, but everybody knows what Barnabas did. Well, no, not necessarily. Luke reported on Barnabas' gift, but that doesn't mean that Barnabas himself trumpeted it out when he gave it. From all that we know of Barnabas, that we read of him in the scriptures, it seems far more likely that he sold the land, he brought it to the apostles privately, or at least in the general scope when everybody was bringing offerings to the apostles. But the news of his gift got around. And it makes sense that it would. If the financial donation was large enough, you know, the rest of the church is going to wonder, where did all this financial windfall come from? Some gifts are kind of hard to keep anonymous if they're big enough, and this seems to have stood out from the rest. Now, as for us, we want to be as careful as possible to follow Jesus' instruction on giving. We don't give in order to pat ourselves on the back. We don't need that, right? We don't need a special phone call from the pastor. We don't need a, an exclusive invitation that's reserved for special donors. We don't need a nameplate on a pew or a title on a room going into a building. All we need to do is give a gift to our Heavenly Father as we worship Him. We give generously, we give humbly out of a sincere heart of worship and thankfulness because we're not giving for us. We're giving for Jesus. Barnabas did it rightly, we can too. All right? Luke shows how the church did it right. Amen. Now he's going to give the opposite perspective. Not everybody had the heart of Barnabas, the heart of the majority of the church. There were others who looked out only for themselves, so we see an example of giving wrongly starting in chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' Feet. Now, it doesn't sad, sound so bad until we get to that phrase, his wife also being aware. At this point, we know this is a plot or a conspiracy. They were landowners, just like Barnabas had been. They were willing to sell their possession, donate the proceeds to the church. But instead of donating the full amount, they wanted to keep back some for themselves. But they claimed that they donated all. Husband and wife agreed on the story, getting their lie set up in advance. Instead of humility in giving, like Barnabas and others within the church did, this is arrogance in giving. This is giving done for show. Now, perhaps they were inspired by Barnabas and others like him. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to be known for their generosity as well. They wanted the reputation of generosity without the heart of generosity. Now, keep in mind that any donation was welcome. It would have been received with joy. If Ananias and Sapphira wanted to give a smaller amount, there was no problem. The problem was how they desired to be seen. 
So this is pride, this is selfishness, this is arrogance. It was going through the motions of giving. And we can go through the motions of giving just like we can go through the motions of worship. We can raise our hands, say all the language, and be sincere on the outside without being sincere on the inside, which isn't sincerity at all. And these two things are closely related because giving is a form of worship. Without sincerity, it's meaningless. It doesn't matter if you go through the motions. You need something real. You need genuineness. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. See, Peter wasn't fooled at all. He immediately confronts Ananias on the gift, calling him out for his deception to the church and ultimately his lie to the Holy Spirit. You say, well, wait a second, this is pretty amazing stuff, but how did Peter know what had happened? You know, this is a secret conspiracy known only by Ananias and his wife. Did the apostles send out investigators to, to double-check every real estate transaction? Of course not. I don't have resources, time, or desire to do this, that sort of thing. The only way Peter could have known was through divine revelation. The Holy Spirit gave Peter the knowledge of Ananias' sin. This is a clear demonstration of the gift of the word of knowledge. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. The difference between the two, the word of no uh, wisdom... The word of wisdom is having exactly the right word at the right time, ourselves having no possible way to think of it in the moment. The word of knowledge is having facts we wouldn't otherwise know apart from the revelation of the Holy Spirit. By the way, there are many gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's only a few that get all the attention. <laughs> but there's many gifts of the Spirit. Here are a couple. Luke does not directly identify this gift in his writing, but there's no doubt at all this is a clear demonstration of the word of knowledge. God the Spirit wanted this act exposed for what it was, and Peter had the faith to follow through and call it out. Now, keep in mind, Ananias did not have to give the full amount. Ananias did not have to give any amount. The money was his to do what he wanted to with it. And Peter made this perfectly clear. There had been no manipulation on the part of the apostles. There was no pressure on the rest of the church. You know, keep up with the Joneses. He gave that much. You've got to give more. Wasn't any special status of super Christian handed out to those who gave more. And Ananias and Sapphira could have used the money for whatever they wanted. Even not even given a penny of it to the church if they didn't want to do so. The decision for this couple to lie about the gift rested with them and them alone. See, the problem is one of the heart. And specifically, it was Ananias' satanically filled heart. It's interesting that the word used for filling is exactly the same word when it's talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Satan filled Ananias' heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter doesn't come right out and say Ananias was a false convert. In fact, the circumstances may imply the opposite because Ananias is among the believers of the early church and the early church is growing, but still small enough or people to know one another by first name. Uh, the, the text doesn't say whether or not Ananias and Sapphira were false converts or true converts, so we can't be definitive either way on the issue. But what we do know is that their hearts were filled with the things of Satan rather than the things of God. Even if their souls were sealed by the Holy Spirit, their desires were that of the devil. Can born-again Christians be possessed by Satan? Absolutely not. But can Christians be influenced by Satan? Yes. Can Christians allow our own hearts to be filled up with worldly sinful desires and end up falling into the traps of Satan? Sadly, all too often. Paul wrote that we are slaves to those whom we present ourselves to obey, be it of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness, according to Romans 6.16. Now, we have been freed by Jesus to live in the freedom given to us by the Spirit that we might serve God, but many Christians don't live in that freedom. So they give themselves back over to slavery. They give themselves back over to the stuff offered by the world and by Satan, and that's 
the satanic stuff fills their heart. We want to beware. Do a self-inventory. What's in your heart? Your heart's going to be filled with something. I guarantee it's not going to be empty. Let it be filled with the things of God. By the way, before we leave this, don't miss Peter's really important theology. The Holy Spirit is God. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, verse 3. Thus he lied to God, verse 4. Holy Spirit is not a force, not an inanimate object, not electricity. The Holy Spirit is a person. You can't lie to a force. You can only lie to a person. Now, as God, he cannot be deceived, but he can be lied to. He wasn't deceived, but he was despised. That's the sin of Ananias. Verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed at last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now with Peter's confrontation came immediate judgment. It wasn't Peter who judged. Peter just called out the sin. It was God who judged. Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, so the Spirit struck him dead. Now that sounds harsh to our ears, doesn't it? That sounds pretty dramatic. It sounds so unlike the Lord. We think, well, what about the love of God? What about the numerous opportunities He gives us to confess our sins and to repent? So often we rely upon the fact, I'm going to get the chance to confess my sin and repent. And perhaps we rely on that a bit too much because if we didn't think we'd get a chance to repent, we might find ourselves sitting a whole lot less. Because usually when we're thinking that far ahead, we're choosing to engage in that sin. Ananias got nothing. He lied one time, and he was struck dead with the young men of the church having to bury his body out back. See, there were different responsibilities for the youth ministry back then. <laughs> Can you imagine them coming down from upstairs and having work to do like that? But this sort of thing nags at us that he would be struck dead like this. Was this right of God? Was it fair? Yes, it was right, and yes, it was fair. Now, whatever God does is right by definition. He is the source of righteousness, so there's nothing that God does that is not right. Now, when it comes to fairness, fairness doesn't necessarily come into play. We think things have to be fair. They don't have to be fair necessarily. But even so, it was. See, there was an action. There was a reaction. By physics, that's fair. Too often, we think of fairness the wrong way. We want to compare fairness between sinners and sinners. But when do we think what's fair to God? If we're truly asking what's fair, then what we're asking for is justice. And there's no question God gave it. Ananias sinned, and there was an immediate just response. The Bible says that there is a sin that leads unto death, 1 John 5, 16, and obviously this was one. Now, as to not getting a chance to repent, guess what? Sometimes we don't get the chance. You know, you go drunk driving once, that can end in a grave. Sometimes you don't get a chance to repent. Uh, one instance of infidelity can lead to death of a marriage. It could lead to disease that goes to death. Sometimes you don't get the chance. And it's not that Christians are immune from falling into these kinds of sins. It's not that we somehow lose our salvation the moment that we do. But let's be honest, sometimes we don't get that opportunity to repent. And with those times, sometimes God uses those things as an example to the rest. You know, God did this in the ancient days with Israel when the nation of Israel was still fairly new. They were taking their own baby steps into the, the nation that was going to be given to them by God. You might remember in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, there was a, a man named Achan who had taken some, some stuff from Jericho when he shouldn't have taken it at all. And so the whole nation experienced defeat at the next place that they went to go fight an Ai. And God judged Achan and his whole family for that sin. Same thing happened here. In fact, most scholars think that this was somewhat of a parallel to that event in, Acts, uh, in Joshua chapter 7. This is how the early church would have seen that event. An example was made of Ananias, demonstrating what? That God is holy. 
God does not abide by sin ever. He was holy, is holy, will always be holy. That's part of his essential character. You say, well, God is love. Yes, God is love, but that does not erase or negate the fact that God is holy. Those two exact characteristics can coexist in the same God, and they do. What really bothers us is we think, does this mean that what happened can, with Ananias can happen with us? That's what it really comes down to. It hasn't, but that doesn't mean that it can't. It happened in the same church only a few hours later. Look at verse 7. That was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Now, Peter already knew what happened. He didn't need another gift of the word of knowledge at this point. But he gave a gift to Sapphira, even though Sapphira didn't recognize it at the time. He gave her the opportunity to come clean and repent. Yeah. Just say it up front. Just say it up front. Be honest. But she didn't take it. Instead, she proves she's part of the conspiracy. Look what happened, verse 9. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So foolish, so foolish. God's not going to be tested. Again, we saw with the, the nation of Israel when they're wandering through the wilderness, God does not allow himself to be tested. He judges his people when they tried to test him in their wilderness wanderings. Guess what? The New Testament church needed to learn the exact same lesson. So another immediate judgment, another immediate burial, Again, the youth ministry stayed very busy that day. <laughs> Verse 11, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Just classic biblical understatement. You bet great fear came upon all the church. Can you imagine what raced through the mind of the next person who brought an offering to the feet of the apostles? Aren't you glad we don't pass the plate right now? And it's not just the church. Did you see that? It wasn't just the church. The news of this spread quickly. Fear came upon all who heard these things. In other words, the holiness of God, the zeal God has for purity within his church was known among the non-believers as well. The judgment of Ananias and Sapphira was a witness of the wrath of God and the truth of the gospel. And you say, hold on a second. How does a husband and wife falling dead by the judgment of God prove the gospel? Answer, because it demonstrates God's living activity among his church. It showed what God approved and what he disapproved. He disapproved of the deceptive, satanically inspired pretense of worship through financial gifts. He approved of the message that was preached by the rest. Because why would God judge one and not the other? If the message of the apostles had been false, then surely they would have dropped dead, not someone who just lied about a donation to a false cause. But the apostles lived while Ananias and Sapphira died. Their judgment proved the gospel true, and it caused the rest to fear. How awesome would it be for our city to so see the work of God among us that they couldn't help but know that he is alive and recognize the truth of the gospel. They'll see it as we praise his name and they'll see it as we are disciplined in his name. But may they see it. So two gifts from two very different kinds of people there was the pure-hearted, those who shared a common purpose, a love for one another, those who continually testified of the one gospel of Jesus Christ. They just desire to love God, love each other, and so their gifts are pure and humble. And then there's a sad example of the opposite, a couple who desired self-glorification rather than the glory of God, who went through the motions of worship and ultimately faced the judgment of God. Now between the two, choice is obvious. We want our gifts to be pure-hearted. We want our love to be true. We want our worship to be sincere. We want our witness to be faithful. Faithful not only to the truth of the gospel of Jesus, but faithful to the king.
character of Jesus. Jesus doesn't lie, so we don't lie. Jesus didn't exalt himself, so we don't exalt ourselves. Instead, Jesus loved God and loved others, so do we. We do the best we can with the resources we have, being obedient to God the Holy Spirit as he leads. Now, of course, there's a huge underlying issue in all of this. The example that we see here in the text is financial giving, but the root of it is the hearts of those who gave. On one hand, you've got those who are submitted to the Lord. On the other hand, you have those who are in rebellion against the Lord. Some openly lied to him. And we can lie to God about so much more than our finances. We can lie to God about our devotion. We can lie to God about our priorities. We can lie to God about, you know, oh, I just don't have time to do this for you. I don't have time. <laughs> it's funny how we'll tell God in prayer, we don't have time to pray. But we do it. We lie to God about all kinds of things. We need to stop lying to God. Just be honest. Bring what you have. And bring it in sincerity, humble faith. We can even lie about our own salvation. Many people do. And I would implore you to take time to be honest with yourself this morning. Are you truly submitted to the Lord Jesus? Now, I'm not asking if you've, you've prayed a prayer of salvation. I'm not asking if you've answered an altar call at a church service or revival. I'm asking if Jesus Christ is your Lord and King. If your whole life, your past, present, and future is 100% dependent upon Him, knowing that without Jesus you have no hope whatsoever. Do believe without a doubt that Jesus died on the cross and that he did so because you deserved to die on the cross and he did so as a substitute for you, paying your penalty, coming back to life. Be honest. A lot of people call Jesus Lord because they think that it's his name, not because they mean the title. They refer to him as God without giving in thought to what it means. Today, you need to mean it. You need to be honest. And if you have been lying to God in the past about what you believe about him, today is the day you need to stop. And you need to surrender yourself to him in faith. Give your life to Jesus Christ asking to be saved. And you can do that right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending him for us. And thank you for making it clear that he came for us, that he died for us, and that he rose from the grave. And I do pray for any among us today who have not yet surrendered themselves to Jesus, that this would be the moment that they do so. that in their hearts, Lord, right now they would confess to you their sin, the ways they've rebelled against you in the past, the way they've tried to be the Lord of their own life, their own master, their own king. And as they confess them to you, help them acknowledge, admit, and believe that Jesus is truly God in the flesh who died for them and who rose from the grave in victory. Help them surrender their life to Jesus, asking Jesus to be their king right now, to be their savior, to forgive them of all their sins, and then fill them with the Holy Spirit. Give them the assurance of salvation that only the Spirit can give so they can walk in freedom and truth. Lord, for all of us, help us live in faith. Help us live in sincerity. Help us live in humility. Unite us together with one heart and one soul. Give us one common purpose in the gospel to where everything else becomes prioritized so that Jesus is known in our city and beyond and we might be witnesses of him. Lord, we thank you when we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.